Hello, beautiful, beautiful people. Today, we are going to examine the Western Front of the First World War. We will see how Bismarck's nightmare of fighting a two-front war becomes a reality for Germany. We will see how it becomes quickly apparent uh, that this is going to be uh, not a short war. It becomes a stalemate quite early in the conflict. We will examine unrestricted submarine warfare. This is Germany's attempt to win the war. And then we will finally examine two very fateful decisions that the German government makes that is going to have very, very, very long-lasting and consequential effects. Let us begin. We last left off with a single pistol making all the difference in the world. An assassination in the Balkans has because of treaties, because of bad blood, because of a great many forces that we examined in our last lesson led to war. Now, the Germans undertake the Schlieffen Plan, constructed following the uh, Franco-Prussian War. This is a plan to bypass, bypass the German-French border, which is way too fortified, pass through neutral Belgium, breaking a, a, a 1839 treaty, but hopefully we can knock out Paris very, very quickly, pacify France, and focus on Russia. And so the Germans invade neutral Belgium. However, we saw in our last lesson, Belgium is far from a pushover. They put up a much bigger fight than had previously been expected. We all remember brave little Belgium. Well, this invasion um, results in Britain entering the war. Britain crosses the channel into France. This is another enemy that has now entered the ring against Germany and Austria. Remember Belgium, enlist today. A scrap of paper, the uh, Germans called that treaty that guaranteed the neutrality of Belgium. Well, we are going to war with us over a scrap of paper. So be it. And so here we have it. The Germans and the Austrians, the Italians never commit. The Italians never commit. They finally switch sides anyways. So throw the Italians out of the way. For the first phase of the war, it is the German Empire and the Austrian-Hungarian Empire against Russia, France, and Great Britain. Reactions to the outbreak of war. Well, remember, there hasn't been a major conflict, a major conflict in Europe since the Napoleonic Wars. Certainly, we have the Franco-Prussian War. Certainly, we have the Crimean War. I'm not saying there wasn't war in Europe since the Napoleonic Wars, but I'm talking about these giant wars, like, like the wars of religion of the 15 and 1600s, where multiple parties are at war for many, many years. We haven't seen that since the Napoleonic Wars. Now, there were a minority of Europeans that were very, very much against this war from the beginning. We have pacifists. We have um, communists that say this is just another rich man's war fought by poor men. Why do young men have to die because leaders um, can't get along? Cousins cannot get along. That being said, as German troops crossed the Belgian frontier, most people in Europe believed that the boys would be home by Christmas. The Kaiser told leaving troops, quote, you'll be back before the autumn leaves fall. It'll be over. It'll be over by October. Don't you worry. Don't you worry, lads. For the most part, people went to the streets and celebrated. These are young men in Vienna holding up signs of the Kaiser and the Emperor Franz Joseph. Outside Buckingham Palace, the day that war was declared. In front of the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg, Russia. Here is Munich in Bavaria, Germany, where a crowd gathers to celebrate the declaration of war. In the crowd, in the crowd, many years later, the photographer, having heard that this man said that he was there, looked, he scanned the photograph because this man had said, I was there standing in the square 
as we sang out in joy. There he is. There he is. Um, Adolf Hitler is said to have been in this photograph. Many argue that it was doctored, that he didn't have that broom uh, mustache until uh, the war to keep a gas mask on. That's why that became fashionable, so that you could still wear a gas mask. Um, it may have been doctored. Uh, we don't quite know. Historians don't agree. But he was certainly there, and he was very enthusiastic, very enthusiastic with the uh, announcement of the outbreak of the war. Here is a crowd of reservists in France rushing off to war. Now, they were told by their leaders they would be home by Christmas. And so this was seen as a great statement of patriotism, nationalism, glory, a way to get rid of old beefs, settle old scores, to realign Europe. Remember, Europe had become a very different place since the uh, Congress of Vienna. Here are people pouring in to a recruitment office in Britain. Sign me up for king and country, for king and country, and not just in Britain, right? This is an imperial war, so we have Canadians enthusiastically signing up for the war. This is my great-grandfather. This is my father's granddad. Um, he signed up for the war. He will fight for the British. Charles was his name. And then uh, my other great-grandfather from my mother's side signs up for the Germans. Yes, this is uh, Jacob. Um, I am named after him. Uh, well, my mom had two grandpas, a Jacob and a Jack. I became Jake. I know you guys are so interested in that. But there we go. You see, uh, everyone, everyone knew someone, loved someone who will serve in this war. And many are going to know someone who dies and loved someone who dies in this war. Now, these great patriotic paintings are left over from a from a time before. You still had paintings, but you still have you, now you have photography. And photography, I think, gives us such a better insight into the realities of this. This man is departing, giving his wife a kiss in the cheek. Don't worry, dear. I'll be home before the leaves turn. Now, the Russian volunteers don't look nearly as happy as everyone else, but that is the that is the life of a Russian during this time. On to glory. On to serve the emperor, the kaiser, the king. You name it. This boy is kissing his mother goodbye. This man's kissing his love goodbye. Don't worry, guys. At least home by Christmas, right? Of course. Of course. Leaders are never wrong about these things, are they? No. No kings, presidents, emperors. I love these images. Just know that most of the men that you see, because they were the first wave, uh, most of the men that you see are not going to return home. Just off the top, please know that. That adds to the tragedy and beauty of these images. The band's playing great patriotic songs. People are singing nationalist anthems. Don't worry, guys. Don't worry. We're off to Paris. These are German troops. They'll have to cut through Belgium, and that becomes the issue, doesn't it? Because the Belgians don't just them, let them simply come through. Now, in Britain, to help recruiting efforts, Hitchner, the 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 warrior of the Sudan, uh, the butcher of the Boers, depending on who you speak to, he is the Secretary of State for War in Britain during the war. And it is his face that is used to recruit British soldiers, men of the moment. You see, we're trying to liken this war to the great colonial wars of Africa. Oh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. We have Maxim guns. Well, the other side has Maxim guns. But Kitchener is such a symbol of British militarism that only his face could sell this to young men. Are you one of Kitchener's own? Well, are you boys? Your country needs you. Britons, 
We want you. Yes, if it looks familiar when America finally does enter the war, Uncle Sam wants you. That's taken directly from these Kitchener posters. Uh, George Orwell, um, a young man during this time, uh, was very much influenced by this these images of Kitchener everywhere. And when he wrote 1984 um, in 1948, he envisioned a world where the government is giving you orders and watching you constantly. The Big Brother is Watching You posters of 1984 is directly inspired by those Kitchener posters that he saw as a young man. Side note, bit of trivia for you. Don't forget, this is an imperial war. And so France brings its imperial subjects. Britain brings its imperial subjects. Young men from India, from Central Africa, are now fighting because cousins cannot get along. This is the price of imperialism. This is the face of imperialism. Algerians, Moroccans, Southeast Asians, Indians. They, too, are fighting for king and country. Here is a young man from um, Southeast Asia, French-held Indochina, modern-day Vietnam, with a North African, both members of the French Empire. These are some Southeast Asians, I believe Burmese, part of the British Empire. Don't forget the, the, the territories of Australia, New Zealand, Canada. Those boys, too, go and fight for king and country. Again, this is a world war, an imperial war. Pro-war arguments. There were a number of convincing, or at least at the time, convincing pro-war arguments made across the board. Now, these weren't, this isn't top down. This is, this is, this is a, 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 a commonly held beliefs. One of them is this will get rid of the bad blood. This will be get. This will get. It's been a hundred years of bad blood building, building and building. This will get rid of it. Uh, do not underestimate the powers of nationalism, imperialism, irrationalism, militarism. All will play a giant role. This was expected to be a short war, like the Franco-Prussian War. That was the model that all parties believed they were working on. Both sides thought it's now or never. The enemy is only going to grow stronger. Germany believes that about Britain. Britain believes that about Germany. France believes that about Germany, etc. Let's hit them now before they build up too much. For some, war was seen as a positive thing, meant to bring out the best in individuals. Also, some social Darwinists, remember, that is a major force, especially in universities and in public policy, believed that this that war is a good thing. It gets rid of the weak um, and it redraws maps. It redraws spheres of influence. Let's get rid of the weak, the people, the, 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 the nations, the forces that shouldn't be here. Um, however, interestingly enough, there were some scientific racists during the time who make the argument that we are just getting rid of good European blood. Why, why is a German killing a Brit? There were a number of especially German racial theorists that were against this on racial grounds, but a very small minority furthermore germany austria or austria hungary and russia were led by absolute rulers who believed that this would make their country more cohesive each one of those countries that i just mentioned are dealing with internal unrests increasing un in e internal unrest and so it's believed that this war is going to make things better, more cohesive at home. They're going to rally around their leader. Remember, the Tsar thought that when they went into battle with the Japanese. I love these images. You'll see Japan is listed here. Japan will enter the war on the side of the Allies. Hungry for German um, territory in the Pacific.
just so you know, and I'm, I don't know if you've caught this, Russia has three flags they're uh, using during this time. You have the yellow flag with the imperial eagle on it. You have St. Andrew's cross here next to the British flag. And then you have the the the, the tri flag um, in a horizontal manner, the, the Russian flag that we see today, very similar to Montenegro's uh, and Serbia's on each corner. Here are the allies. There you go. There's back to the Russian flag. I love these postcards. I have way too many. Okay, just so you know. Uh, the Ottomans and the Bulgarians will soon join the Central Powers, as they will be known. And so they are building allies themselves, although the Germans are going to do most of the fighting. The Austrians, Bulgarians, and the Ottomans are not going to do very well. This is really a Germany versus uh, the world war, <laughs> or at least Europe, and then the United States. Serbia's end. Again, I told you, I warned you, I have way too many of these. There's the central powers, there you can see. From Berlin to Constantinople. Ladies were used to sell this war. Uh, wood gnomes were used to sell this war. There is a large number of kids on these postcards as well in the national costumes or the imperial dress of their native nation. Absolutely adorable for the record. The contrast between such a terrible war, these cute images, I don't know. To me, it's it's kind of interesting. Here is a Turkish cheese vendor feeding all of the central power kids. <laughs> Absolutely adorable. A war on two fronts. A war on two fronts. Two things had to occur for the Schlieffen plan to work. Belgium had to offer very little resistance, but it does offer quite a bit of resistance. And Russia had to reach Germany very slowly. Um, it doesn't. It gets there much faster than we thought. Brave little Belgium puts up more of a fight than we had previously thought. This allows the British to arrive in northern France. As the British land in northern France, Germany is still stuck in Belgium, and this allows the British to join the French. This is not what the Germans wanted. This was not supposed to happen. Furthermore, because the Russians had been maneuvering so early and so heavily, they actually make it to Eastern Prussia much quicker than previously thought. The Schlieffen plan is falling apart. Russia is now at the back of Germany, and France is far from out of the war. German officials have to pull troops out of Belgium and send them to eastern Prussia to meet the Russians. This slows down the German progress into France. We are not interested in Belgium. We are interested in France. And now we have to turn around and go fight the Russians. This is this leads to the Battle of Tannenberg. Now, I am not going to bog you down with too many details of any of these battles, but just know, just know, um, the Germans do very, 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 very well against the Russians. In fact, the, the Germans that are there beat the Russians before that other force comes that needed to help, that leave Germany, that leave Belgium to help. They've already defeated the Russians soundly. They're not out of the war, but they are defeated soundly. Out of the 150,000 men in the Russian army, at Tannenberg, only 10,000 actually managed to escape. The rest were either killed or taken as prisoners of war. German casualties, 12 to 20,000. Bad, but not nearly as bad as what happens to the Russians at Tannenberg. They are sent through a meat grinder. 
They are sent through a meat grinder. This was an absolute crushing defeat for the Russians. Tannenberg, Russian prisoners of war. There was a giant monument made to Germany's victory over Russia at Tannenberg. It was demolished after the war, but this is very Germanic, very Teutonic. If you look at the surviving photographs of this great memorial, Tannenberg. There it is, destroyed after the war, this monument to German militarism. The effects. Well, Russians become painfully awakened to the fact that they are decades behind Germany when it comes to the art of war. It is after Tannenberg that Japan enters the war on the side of the Allies. More and more demonstrations will take place in Russia against the war. This is going to build, and as much as the Tsar and his secret police and his uh, 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 domestic apparatchiks try, they can't suppress dissent. More and more Russians are dying on the on the uh, German Eastern Front, and this war becomes increasingly unpopular. The Battle of Tannenberg also makes two heroes. Two heroes uh, for Germany, and these two men are going to come to dominate Germany. In fact, they will become part of what was called the silent dictatorship, the silent dictatorship. Very briefly, I just want to introduce you to these men. General Eric Ludendorff. General Eric Ludendorff was a mountain of a man, six foot three, 100% uh, dedicated to the military. He is a Prussian through and through, and he was instrumental at not only the victory at Tannenberg, but the final defeat of the Belgians at Liege. Um, he had been preparing for this war for years. Uh, he used to go on holiday to Belgium before the war and just inspect it and look, if war should break out, how are those fortifications? Where does this road go? He was always plotting and scheming. Legend has it that while in while in Belgium, while in Belgium, let me see here. There he is as a young man, 1882. There we go. While in Belgium, he's trying to get his troops through the country. And the Belgians are, are, are putting up a hell of a resistance from this town. Legend has it that he ran over and started knocking on the doors of these Belgian soldiers with his sword, the, the butt of a sword. Bam, bam, bam. Get out of here. We're trying to get into France as bullets are flying past Ludendorff's head. He's just so frustrated that these Bloody Belgians are putting up such a resistance. His, his, his target was, of course, uh, France. There is Ludendorff. Ludendorff, by the way, has a plan for Eastern Europe. He wants to remove all of the ethnic Slavs, all of the Russians and the Poles, and move German colonists into the area to take over this land, much like the uh, Americans did with the Native Americans. We move the Slavs off the land and we put Germans in their place. This is his plan. This plan is going to become very popular with a man who will have a very interesting relationship with Ludendorff. We'll get there later. Hint, hint, hint. He was in Munich when it was announced that we were going to the war, but that is another story. The other man who comes to dominate The German military and German society in general is Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg. He was a Prussian-German Field Marshal, the other hero of Tannenberg. Uh, Field Marshal was the highest rank one could attain in the Prussian and later the German army. He comes from an old, distinguished family. Um, he attends the best military academies. He is, he, again, he's Prussian. The military is his life. And Hindenburg comes to represent what is best about the German officer uh, corps. Uh, he was brave. He was there at Versailles when the uh, Prussia leader was made emperor of all the Germans. He comes to represent all that is best with the Prussian virtues of war. There is Field Marshal Hindenburg. Now, it is Hindenburg and Ludendorff that become the silent dictatorship. 
This is a term historians apply to these two men because increasingly, especially after 1916, they come to dominate. They come to dominate decision-making within the German army. And after the war, they won't blame themselves. They will blame everyone else but themselves for the loss of the First World War. Now, the Kaiser liked to play military. He loved the uniforms. He loved the outfits. But by 1916, by the way, how cool does he look there? My God. The Germans don't do themselves any favors by some of the symbolism that they use, right? Um, as cool as the skull and crossbones look, it doesn't exactly make you look like the good guys if this is a film. But I'm just saying, increasingly, especially by 1916, the Kaiser has become unnerved. Germany's not winning the war. And so he comes to rely more and more on Hindenburg and Ludendorff. Um, Hindenburg is much more pliant. He's much more agreeable. Ludendorff um, is steadfast. And Ludendorff really comes to dominate behind the scenes. Just know that. This becomes a military dictatorship. Here they are, those two Prussian titans. The Kaiser increasingly comes to rely on their advice solely, solely. Stalemate. Now, the Western Front will be our focus. Just know the whole time ta I'm talking to you, the Eastern Front, the Russian Front, and the Austrians and the Ottomans are fighting as well. But we have to focus on something, the Western Front, because it comes to embody the First World War, at least for the British, the French, and the Americans. Um, the Second World War will focus on the Eastern Front, just to play equal time. A stalemate is a situation in which further action or progress by opposing or competing parties seems impossible. No, It becomes quickly apparent. No one's winning the war, but no one is losing the war. Stalemate on the Western Front. Well, it kicks off with the invasion of France. By late August, the Germans have entered Brussels. Belgium has been subjugated. Um, it took much longer than expected, but the goal was always to take out France and then throw everything we have against the Russians. In the first month of the war, in the first month of the war, the Germans do quite well against the French. Um, however, 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 they stop short of taking Paris. They stop just short of taking Paris. And now the British have joined the French. German Sailors marching through the streets of Brussels, making their way to Paris. That's the objective. That is the objective. Things come to a head at the First Battle of the Marne. The Germans get as far as that dotted line. They are right outside of Paris. However, the French and the British begin to push them back away. This was the one chance Germany had at a quick victory. The taking of Paris would have done it. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Famously, the Parisian taxi cabs were used to take French troops to the front. And it happened. It happened. We have paintings of this, of course, but you can look at photographs. Uh, uh, thousands of cabs, buses were used to ship troops to the front. It's one of those great stories from the First World War. The Parisian cabs. We've entered the modern age. We, not even trains or horses anymore. We are taking cabs. Today, we take Ubers to go and fight our war. Now, this is going to be a very, very bloody war, an incredibly bloody, bloody war. Over 2 million men will fight at the First Battle of the Marne, and as many as half a million will be killed or wounded during this battle. One of the reasons we have such high numbers is because in the early stages of the war, officers are sending troops in with 19th century tactics and stratagem. What do I mean? Well, in the 1800s, you sent your men in with waves upon waves of men, and you took the other people's line. This doesn't work in the First World War, and it takes many months. More, It takes years in some respects, to break 
commanding officers of this tactic. This is what they've been trained on since childhood at these military academies. The problem is, is that the other side has machine guns. Both sides have machine guns. And so that tactic doesn't work. And so we see giant numbers of dead in these early battles between the allies and the central powers. In the end, the Germans lose the battle. They lose the battle. It is a French victory. It is a French victory helped by the British. Here are German prisoners of war taken by the French, but the war is far, far, far from over. The effects, the effects. Well, the French and the British prevent a German taking of Paris. This ends all possibility of a speedy victory. However, however, the Germans are now going to fight or be forced to fight a two-front war, Russia and France. This is everything that Bismarck, now dead, worked against. This is not what we wanted. This is not what we wanted. This is what we got. The race to the sea. This was a, uh, a, a series of events. After the Battle of the Marne, each side sought to outflank each other. And what happened is they raced all the way to the sea. Um building fortifications as they went. This is the famous race to the sea as both sides, the Germans and the French and the British, sought to outflank one another, reaching all the way to the English Channel. This will result in a stalemate and the birth of trench warfare. This becomes the face of the war. Now, the Germans... built their trenches a little bit more to last because they understood they have to hold this ground, whereas the French and the British made temporary trenches. And so when you look at images, you'll see the German trenches are always much better, and the Germans are just better at engineering uh, 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 in general. But this was meant at first to be a temporary measure. Uh, this is not going to be a temporary measure. You can see the Germans always have the little twigs in there to keep it from uh, collapsing. This becomes this becomes the face of the First World War. Remember, too, this is a time before a tour of duty. If you were uh, signed up from the beginning, you will fight all the way through to the end. Men will spend years in the trenches, sleeping, eating, sobbing. In the early phase of the war, the Germans are still wearing the spiked helmet. That'll change. You'll see as we move on, the Germans will adopt the uh, lower-sided uh, helmet. Terrible, terrible conditions. You can't see over the side or you'll be shot by a sniper. Talk about stress. The British use the frying pan. The helmet. Meant for shrapnel falling downwards, not bullets coming forward. This becomes a way of life, life in the trenches. Now, this part of Europe has a high clay content in the dirt. And what that means is that it rains. It takes a quite a long time for it to drain. And so mud becomes a permanent fixture of life in the trenches. Puddles could last for weeks, months. Men wrote about the constant mud, the constant sound, the smell of rotting corpses, bombs raining down 24 hours a day, sniper bullets going past your head. Mud was a constant enemy of troops. Keeping your feet dry was a very important task. Um, because it was very dangerous to remain uh, steeped in mud for very long. And so your feet would be inspected. Your commanding officer would go, are you keeping your feet dry? Yes, sir, I promise. Let's see. Foot inspection. I'm going to show you an image. You're free to look away. Again, please, I'll tell you when to, it's okay to look back. But trench foot 
was a very constant thing. Men lost their toes, their feet because of trench foot. Okay, you can look back, but it's not going to be much better. Uh, rats. Rats everywhere. Rats in the trenches here for your food, for your body heat. Men had a very good time passing the day hunting rats. I had a student ask me, did they eat them? I don't think so. Maybe when times were very bad, but no, I've never read a primary account of, 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 of troops on the Western Front eating rats, but they certainly had fun hunting the rats. You would too if they were nibbling at your ear when you slept at night. Competitions between the troops. Lice was a constant problem as well. A constant problem all over you, constantly. Ugh, gross. And so uh, you see more and more troops having their heads shaved. This becomes standard in this war. The area between the enemy trenches was known as no man's land. And God help you if your commanding officer, who's not going to go with you nine times out of ten, well, not nine times out of ten, but often sends you across no man's land. Your chance of survival was very minimal. Machine guns, mines, barbed wire, sniper fire. Um, this is where men died. No man's land. These images look like they're from the moon sometimes. These were forests. These were beautiful farms. Absolute ruin. Absolute ruin. No man's land. Once a forest in Flanders. The first year at Christmas, we're not home yet, the Germans and the British and the French, the men on the on the front had a Christmas truce. You might have already heard about this. Uh, they were singing Christmas carols, and suddenly one comes or walks across no man's land and offers the other a cigarette. And for a brief time, they realize, wait a minute, we're, we're not different. We sing the same Christian uh, 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 songs at Christmas. We, 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 we love our children. We work the land. We work in a factory. We're not that different. They even played some friendly games of soccer, football. Um, just know that after this, everyone was commanded, do not leave at Christmas. You'll be shot. Because God forbid the leaders of all these countries allow their citizens to realize, wait, we're not that different. Just because cousins can't get along doesn't mean that we should be killing each other. So you'll never see another Christmas truce. New technologies. One of the reasons why there is a stalemate on the Western Front is new technologies. Neither side can gain ground because both sides have monstrous technologies. This was a time of innovation. The 1800s was a time of new inventions, the train, the telegraph, new dyes, chemicals. Well, in the First World War, all of these new technologies are used to kill one another. And this is why we have so many millions of people killed during this war. This is the first truly modern war. We had tastes of it with the American Civil War and the Franco-Prussian War. But this is truly the first modern war. Some of these innovations are quite fun, are quite interesting. Uh, being able to play uh, sounds from incredibly far away, commanding the troops, being able to listen in on your enemy. These guys were trying everything on both sides to try to get the upper hand. He wants to be able to hear what's going on across the field. How do you prevent air raids or bombing raids from uh, uh, the enemy? Well, you put up these giant nets across the sky. We have to try. We have to try something. Um, how do you trick the enemy? into thinking that you have far more troops and equipment than they uh, thought. Well, you put up mock-ups. Both sides did this. Both sides experimented with camouflage, sniper fire. This man lays in a field just waiting for you to pop your head up. This is a hollowed-out fake tree. Man climbs in and becomes deadly. Deadly. You're walking along. You're walking along. You hear a gunshot. Your friend's head explodes. Where the hell did that come from? I don't know. All those trees and fields. I don't know. Well, imagine the terror, the tension, the stress.
hauled it out. Fake horse. Again, those men way over there. They get fired upon. It's just a dead horse. How the hell is it shooting at me? So you might laugh at me. That'd be me. Yeah, I'm slow. Yeah, I can't see for anything. That's me. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. <laughs> Men, in order to try to find snipers, would put their hats, their helmets on their rifles, lift it up. Okay, well, we know not to put our heads here. You might even make dummy heads. All of these things are comical now, but it's because men's heads are exploding next to you. New technologies, flamethrowers. My God. My God. This is what new technology means? This is the first modern war. Tracer bullets and artillery to fire at night to track where your uh, uh, shots are being uh, landed. Depth charges. Submarines become an issue. Very much so. Hydrophones, an early form of sonar to try to find where these German U-boats are. We'll get to them in a little bit. Barbed wire, that miracle of the West, allowed the Americans to settle the West, allowed the British to settle Australia, where barbed wire now becomes the face of the First World War. You're ordered to march, to march, to run, to sprint across no man's land. Well, it is drenched in barbed wire tearing your flesh off as you make your way. Flying machines. We have now taken the war to the air. In the early 1900s, the American Wright brothers successfully launch an airplane. Well, in the beginning, airplanes were used as recon to spy on the enemy to see where the troops are moving. Well, with the interrupter gear invented, where the uh, propeller is timed so that you can shoot when it's not in front of you, well, now these things become absolutely deadly machines battling each other in the skies over the Western Front. These men become the new knights, the new knights uh, instead of a horse on the, in their planes, here is the Red Baron, the hero of the Germans, 80 air combat victories. Here is a replica of his plane. New heroes are being made. Artillery, my God. Artillery that can shoot 100 miles away is introduced during this war. Some of these guns are so big, especially the ones that the Germans have, they have to build truck uh, train lines as they move these things around because they are so heavy. They dig into the earth. You can't move them without building a train line as you go. And they put holes in the ground that look like small ponds. And it goes 24 hours a day in some places for weeks, for months. Now, I'm sure you've heard the expression shell-shocked. Shell-shocked comes from the First World War. When you're under a tremendous amount of stress, let's say your brain goes from this to this, right? You have to because a number of reasons. Well, what happens if it goes for so long like this that it doesn't go back? This is what happens to men out in the front. For some, their brain simply doesn't go back. They are completely, it's PTSD. It's PTSD. They didn't have a word for it then. Um, the real tragedy is many times they're accused of cowardice. Oh, you're faking. Some of them were even shot for cowardice. Absolutely tragic. These men were not cowards by any means. They were humans put into unhuman, inhuman conditions. Absolutely. And these are hundreds of thousands of men suffer from this. The tank was invented in the First World War as a way to break through the trenches. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. But this is the invention of the tank to try to roll through the other side. Yes. Another symbol of the First World War. There were many different gases. Some were invisible. Some made you blind. Some made you choke. God help you. God help you. Both sides use gas in this war. 
And so we see another symbol of this war, along with trenches and poison gas, is the gas mask. You would hear a siren go off or a, a, a trumpet go off. Put your masks on. Put They've gassed us. It wasn't that effective, but the threat of it was very effective to the morale of your enemy. And again, this is one of those strange times in human history with a foot in two worlds. We have poison gas, but we're still using horses and they need a gas mask as well. It's, 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 it's a holdover from the previous age. The 1800s is meeting the 1900s. Many soldiers on the front adopted dogs. Dogs were fantastic. Um, they alerted you to an attack. They could run messages. They were company. They deserved gas masks too, did they not? This dog is having messages run, or is running messages, pardon me. Many tales of brave and gallant dogs during this war. Look at this guy. Mutt. The cigarette-delivering French bulldog. Oh, 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 too cute. Too cute. What about Sergeant Stubby? Sergeant Stubby. Now, he'll survive the war. He's an American dog. He makes it back to the war. He visits the White House. Don't worry about Sergeant Stubby. He saw his share of hell, but he made it back alive. It wasn't just dogs and horses and donkeys. Pigeons are used in this war. Number one, we can run messages. We can run messages back and forth with pigeons. That goes back hundreds of years. But also, it was experimental. What about using them for recon? We can put a timed camera that is set to go off every 10 seconds, 5 seconds, and train our pigeons to fly over the enemy and return. These are images taken from one of these spy cameras by a pigeon over a French town. How cool is that? You have a Pigeon's view from the First World War of a French city. Ooh, a chateau. Ooh, la, la. New technologies and old methods of war lead to giant casualty rates. America's bloodiest war, the Civil War, 630,000, 630,000. We count them from both sides, right? We're counting both sides, the South and the North. 630,000. That's an entire war that lasted four years. We have battles where we lose that, that number in, 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 in a couple of days. By the time we get to the Battle of Verdun, the Psalm, 1.2 million. The Spring Offenses, 1.5 million. These are battles. The 100 Days Offensive, 1.8 million. More and more men are dying. More and more men are dying. By 1915, this war, we know, is far from over. For every man that you see, add to him half a million. These are the sort of numbers that we're looking at. On all sides, more and more men are dying. More and more cemeteries are filling up, and there's no peace in sight. The leaders are steadfast. The men on the front are dying. Hospitals are filling. If you would have walked the streets, if you would have walked the streets of, of Berlin, Vienna, Paris, Chicago, following this war, you would have seen um, amputee after amputee. Men mentally physically emotionally crippled by this war and these are just the men that we can see without limbs think of all the people whose minds have been broken in some way think of all the families that no longer have a husband a son a father these guys are smiling they're the lucky ones because they know a great many men who aren't here anymore so they are the lucky ones this is a tragic photograph. This is a proud German soldier following the First World War being reduced to the status of beggar. Remember, this is a time when if you were a, uh, a, a injured veteran, you didn't get uh, a check. You didn't get uh, a special bonus. You were expected to go off and make a life for yourself. Well, that's easier said than done. There he is proudly with his iron cross. 
because so many men were mangled, there were great advances made in prosthetics because so many noses, so many eyes, so many cheeks, and I could show you terrible images, um, images and I'm not because they're absolutely, they'll, they'll give you nightmares of what men's faces became after this war, the survivors. But these were brought in to try to normalize, to try to fix, to try to offset these great, great deformities. All because politicians couldn't get along. All because cousins couldn't get along. That's the real face of war. You can listen to a thousand patriotic hymns, see all these glorious paintings, these propaganda posters. That's the real face of war. The U-boat was introduced during this war. Now, the U-boat introduced by the Germans is going to play a very, very important role in this war to giant consequences, which brings us to number three of our points, unrestricted submarine warfare. Now, unrestricted submarine warfare was introduced by the Germans. However, it was a reaction. The British were the first to blockade Germany. They put its great navy in the North Sea, not allowing Germany to import anything. And so Germany begins to suffer a tremendous amount. Hundreds of thousands of people are dying from sickness. People are beginning to not starve yet. They're going to. Germany is, is suffering because of this blockade. The Kaiser, the Kaiser um, will angrily argue that half a million, half a million uh, Germans have died because of sickness. We can't get medicine, certain medicine. We can't get certain supplies of food. Half a million Germans have died, uh, but we're the monsters of Belgium. The British are responsible for the deaths of German children too. And the Germans decide to respond. They decide to blockade Britain. How do they do this? They do this with U-boats. So you see on the left is the British blockade of Germany. On the right is the German blockade of Britain. We are going to starve. We are going to starve Britain, cut it off from its empire, and force it to come to the peace table, or at least pull out of the war so that they can continue to fight the French and the Russians. This is the objective. Starve Britain of supplies and bring either a surrender or peace talks. We do this with U-boats. We do this with U-boats. Now, at first, at first, the Germans followed the rules of the waves. What they would do is if a ship was coming in, civilian or military, they would, well, not military, they'd sink military, Civilian ships, merchant ships, if they were coming in, the Germans would come up from the uh, 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 the depths, announce themselves, and order the merchant ship to surrender. Once a U-boat is up and exposed, it is very vulnerable. And so many of these merchant ships, even though they weren't military ships, would fire upon these um, German submarines. And so the Germans begin simply bombing everyone, sinking everyone, not bombing, torpedoing everyone, merchant or military or even civilian. They tell the world, do not enter British waters. We are sinking everything. We are trying to starve it of its supplies. And from a U-boat perspective, it's very difficult to know, is it a passenger ship? Is it a merchant ship? Is it a military ship? And once we go up, we are very much vulnerable. Submarines unleashed by Germany. This is unrestricted submarine warfare. Unrestricted war on ships will begin today. Berlin sends a warning to the United States and everyone else. Do not enter British waters. Notices like this go in the newspaper telling Americans and Brits do not do it. Stay where you are. We are choking Britain. Which brings us to the Lusitania. The Lusitania. May 1st, 1915, the Lusitania leaves New York on its way to Liverpool. The Germans have given them a warning. Lusitania, we're telling you, do not enter British waters. Well, 
May 7, 1915, a German U-boat sank the RMS Lusitania with a single torpedo hit off the coast of Ireland. 1,198 lives were taken. 128 of those lives were American. British and U.S. reaction. The British maintained that this was solely a passenger ship. The Germans knew it was a passenger ship. They are butchers. You saw what they did in Belgium. Now they are doing it to people, innocent people, on the high seas. Hundreds of the dead on the Lusitania were children, by the way. And this is this is 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 repeated and repeated and repeated. British propagandists who want to make the Americans as angry as possible beat into their head how dastardly this was. These are innocent people visiting their families, their loved ones, sunk by the vicious Hun. Remember, the British want the Americans to get involved. Innocent people, how dare they? And they are, for the record, they are, for they are. But just don't underestimate the, the importance for the British to, want to get the Americans mad um, because they want the Americans to enter this war. This sinking is used in British propaganda, later American propaganda, in recruiting. Take up the sword of justice, enlist. Look at this poor child, gripped by its mother as it is sunk by the vicious German. Irishmen, avenge the Lusitania. Join the Irish regiment today. Only the Navy can stop this. Again, the skull and crossbones, man. Not a great look as far as propaganda goes. Remember the Lusitania. It is your duty and list today. Now, the British told the Americans that Germany gave every school kid the day off of school in celebration of the sinking of Lusitania. That is not true. That is not true. That is not true. Although the Germans did issue a postcard uh, that doesn't look good, Germany. That doesn't look good. Winston Churchill, who is first admiral of the Navy, is trying his hardest to get the Americans involved. Um, he was actually... I'm not saying he was happy about the sinking of the Lusitania, but he hoped that this would bring the Americans into the war. The German reaction was this. That ship was not innocent. That ship had on it munitions being sent to the British. The Americans who claim to be so neutral are actually encouraging and allowing private groups back in the United States to ship Britain arms. Well, the British deny this. The British deny this very, 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 very much so. Well, many years later, many, 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 many years later, it was uh, explored in Lusitania. Divers discovered the ship was carrying about 4 million U.S. manufactured Remington point three oh oh threes uh the germans were right for the record they were carrying munitions to germany but never let the truth get in the way of a good argument but the british uh were not being 100 percent honest they were it wasn't entirely um a uh, 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 civilian and that explains why it sunk so quickly uh because it was so loaded with 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 weaponry Woodrow Wilson wants to get more involved, but overwhelmingly the American people still don't want war. And so he declares, he declares, May 10th, 1915, quote, there is such a thing as a man being too proud to fight. There is such a thing as a nation being so right that it does not need to convince others by force that it is right. We are not entering the war. Shame on you, Germany, but we are not entering the war. He is reflecting the overwhelming majority of Americans at this time. He's ran, he, re, he ran, he campaigned for re-election in 1916, promising not to get America involved in the war. War in Europe, peace in America, God bless Wilson. He's promised the American uh, uh, mothers, your son is your Nebraska boy is not going to die in some godforsaken field in in Flanders because uh, of me. I promise we're staying out of this war. We're going to sit on the sidelines, keep the United States out of the war, be neutral. But overwhelmingly, increasingly, the Americans are becoming much more sympathetic to the British, the French, the Russians. But again, let Europe burn. 
God has blessed us with two weak neighbors and two giant oceans. Why in the hell should we get involved in Europe? Keep us out of Europe. That's overwhelming with the American people sentiment for the time being. And then more and more things happen. March 24th, 1916, the Germans sink a uh, passenger ferry that was crossing from France to England, killing 55 or killing at least 50 of the passengers. The SS Sussex. There was outrage. Again, Germany, when are you going to stop killing innocent people? What are you doing? The effects. Well, although no U.S. citizens were killed, the incident greatly infuriates the American public. The United States threatens to sever all diplomatic relations with Germany. We might even enter the war. And so Germany issues a declaration, a kind of a, I'm sorry, I promise not to do it again. The Sussex Pledge. The Sussex Pledge. The Germans promise three things. Number one, passenger ships will no longer be targeted, period. Number two, merchant ships will not be sunk unless the presence of weapons had been established. And number three, the crew will be taken off and rescued before we sink these ships. Now, this is a kind of ridiculous promise to make. No passenger ships. Merchant ships will be sunk only if we find they have to let us on to the ship and we will save the crew before we sink their ship. But that is the Sussex Pledge. That is Germany's attempt to keep the Americans out of the war. The effects, well, German supremacy or at least German success begins to plummet. The Germans suffer a major defeat by the British in Jutland, although they claim partial victory in that. Just know this. It soon becomes apparent that the Germans are not going to force the British to the peace table with a Sussex pledge. The Germans look for a way out. And in December of 1916, the German government offers peace to the Allies, and it is turned down. It is turned down. Woodrow Wilson acts as an intermediary. Um, the French and the British turned it down because the Germans, A, don't offer to pull out of any occupied regions. B, don't offer any sort of reparations. Nothing changes. They just want everyone to put their guns down and let's just stop the way we are. And so that peace proposal is turned down. Impossible terms put forward. This war is not going to be over. And Germany is going to feel that they are forced to make some very, very big moves. Two fateful decisions are made in the winter of 1917. Two fateful decisions. The Kaiser hopes that he can bring an end to this war. By 1917, Germany is on the brink of collapse. Far-left communist agitators are making a tremendous bit of trouble in Germany. They are dealing with their own communist threat within Germany. People are hungry. People are starving. Something needs to be done. And so the Kaiser, along with Ludendorff and Hindenburg, take two giant gambles. Two giant gambles. They decide unrestricted submarine warfare will be resumed. It was Vice Admiral Reinhard Scheer who makes the recommendation Germany announces we are going to begin to attack all ships around Britain. We are breaking the Sussex Pledge. U.S. war with Germany seems inevitable. Break of diplomatic relations only course open is general opinion. The effects, well, we do break our diplomatic relations with Germany. Germany. We do break our diplomatic relations with Germany. Um, and then Germany does something else. Germany does something else. At the same time, all of this is happening. This is from Reddit. If you ever want to know the real history of anything, you have to go to Reddit, right? Um, that is a picture of a German student trying to pass a note over to Mexico. America gets its hand on it and it says to Mexico from Germany, hey, you want to beat up America? 
Well, that is a very simple way of describing the Zimmerman note or the Zimmerman telegraph. Before I tell you about it real quick, just know that tension between Mexico and the United States was very bad by the time we get to the 19 teens. Um, it had only been, um, what, 75, less than 75 years, 65, 60 years since the United States took half of Mexico from it um, in the Mexican-American War of 46-48. That is the Mexican Cession. America, the United States, already took Texas from Mexico, or at least allowed Texas to pull away from Mexico and then brought it into the United States. Mexico loses half of its territory. Then the Mexican Revolution occurs, and the United States gets directly involved. It seizes Veracruz in 1914. In 1914, as the war is about to break in Europe, the Americans take the Mexican city of Veracruz. They are getting directly involved in the Mexican Revolution, which was really a Mexican Civil War. Now, they, in the end, they do leave Veracruz, but that creates a lot of animosity from Mexico, who at the time is fighting a civil war. And then Pancho Villa, Pancho Villa, one of the leaders of the Mexican Revolution, invades the United States, invades a small town in New Mexico, uh, Columbus, New Mexico, and the United States decides to act. The United States invades Mexico in search of Pancho Villa, this Mexican bandit. They look for him all over the place. They can't find this Mexican bandit, General John Pershing, and a great many American troops, given the best equipment, go into Mexico to hunt down Pancho Villa. This also leads to tension with Mexico. It also, it also makes the United States look kind of ridiculous. And so Germany sees the United States not being able to catch a Mexican bandit. Am I supposed to be afraid of you? It kind of does to the American status what the Boer War did to the British status. By the way, the Americans will never capture Pancho Villa. He'll die, but it's unrelated. That's a separate uh, quarrel. So that note that got passed in class was Germany seeking an alliance with Mexico if the United States should enter the war. The Zimmerman note said this to Mexico. It's a secret note that the British get their hands on, give to the Americans. If the United States enters the war, and you declare war on the United States. We're going to help you take back Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. We can't take California, uh, Nevada, and the rest of the territories, but we can help you take that back. The British get their hands on it. They give it to the Americans. The Americans ask Germany, is this true? And Germany, being very German, says, yeah, that, that's, that, that was the plan. Anyone else would have just denied it. Goes, That's obviously British propaganda. No, Germany admits. Germany admits this is too much. This, along with the unrestricted submarine uh, uh, warfare, which, by the way, they do sink uh, 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 an American ship during that time. That's too much. Woodrow Wilson now has the support of the American people. He now has the support of Congress, and the United States declares war. This is going to be the tipping point. This is what is going to give the Allies exactly what they needed. Fresh troops and supplies. Fresh troops and supplies. The other fateful decision, which is going to have giant effects in world history, the Kaiser makes a very, 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 very hard decision. There's been a revolution in Russia. This revolution has resulted in the Tsar no longer in power. Now, the Kaiser had tried to make peace with his cousin, his Russian cousin, but the Tsar wanted no peace of it. Now these revolutionaries have taken over the government. However, they've continued to promise to fight against the Germans, these new moderates of the revolution. The, 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 the Tsar is on house arrest, but this new government of Russia, 1917, promises to keep fighting against the Germans. However, there's one group of revolutionaries who do not want to fight this war anymore. This is just a rich man's war fought by poor men, and that is the Bolsheviks. Well, what Germany decides to do is they take a leader of the Bolsheviks, a communist, from his base in Switzerland. He's Russian, but he 
has fled Russia many years before because he would have been killed by the czar's men. They put him on a train, they close the blinds, they lock the door, and they take him from Switzerland all the way through Germany, all the way through Sweden, all the way, and they drop him off at the foot of Russia. This man is going to take over the revolution. This man is going to make this revolution not a liberal revolution, but a communist revolution. This man um, is going to plunge, plunge, plunge Russia into tremendous amount of chaos. It's already in chaos. This man is Vladimir Lenin. Vladimir Lenin, leader of the Bolsheviks, the communists. He was taken there by the German government, German officials. They take him through, they drop him off like a poison, like a like a, like 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 if you have the plague and you sneeze in an envelope and you send it to your enemy and you wait for them to open. This is what they do with Lenin. After Lenin arrives in Russia, all hell breaks loose. In our next lesson, we're going to look at the Russian Revolution that begins as a martyr revolution, ends with a communist revolution, a new poison. Worse than the French Revolution, maybe, is put out across the world. Thank you all very, 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 very much until we meet again.